This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Good evening and welcome to the third and final Chandaria lecture of this year. The Chandaria lectures are made possible by the uh, very generous and wise donation of Shamil Chandaria, who has been a supporter of the Institute of Philosophy and in particular of part of the mission of the Institute to bring topics of philosophical interest and relevance closer together to the techniques and the insights and advances that we have from our colleagues in the sciences. And this series of lectures has been inspired by questions that philosophers have for a very long time been pursuing and where we feel that work either by <laughs> philosophers or by colleagues in the, in the sciences have made progress and advances in showing us how we might tackle an attempt to move on uh, the discussions in these areas. It's been a long and uh, distinguished series of lectures, even though we in the Institute are relatively young. We have had uh, Chandaria lectures from Dan Dennett, from Ray Dolan, uh, increasingly Chandaria laureates, Stephen Neal, Dan Sverber, and now we're very delighted, of course, to be able to add to that list uh, as well as my colleague Colin Blakemore at the end to add um, uh, Vittorio Galesi from uh, University of Parma. And Vittorio uh, is coming to the conclusion of this series and many of you will have been here for the previous lectures and as you know he's been looking at motor resonance and our engagement with aspects of symbolic experience in the first lecture and then more particularly on types of aesthetic experience in the visual arts looking at paintings uh, last week. And from here, continuing this interest in these exalted, significant and important experiences that we classify as aesthetic experience and that matter so much to us, tonight he's going to look at the way in which embodiment and his work in cognitive neuroscience engages with film and the moving image. So, Vittorio, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Uh, this is the third and final lecture. As, uh, as I anticipated in the first one, uh, is going to be dealing uh, mostly with, uh, with film, with moving images. Just before getting started, I would like to um, introduce two caveats. The first one, it both deals with uh, uh, issues uh, that emerged in the very lively and interesting discussion that followed my talk uh, last Wednesday. Uh, the first one is the following. I'll be also in this lecture mainly dealing with uh, sensory motor schemas, motor resonance particularly, which doesn't imply that when I refer to embodiment, I want to confine myself to that dimension. Uh, I, I mainly focus on the sensory motor aspects of embodiment in the first place because it's the one I'm more familiar with. But we are fully aware that uh, equally important is the interoceptive dimension. We are newcomers in the field and we are constantly more and more addressing embodiment also from that specific point of view. Another very interesting point was raised by Colin Blakemore and dealt with the uh, aesthetic specificity of uh, the approach I was summarizing uh, last Wednesday. I think his point was very well taken and if I make it with time, I will address partly uh, uh, that aspect in the very final part of my talk. So today we are dealing with uh, moving, moving images, with film. And uh, similarly to what happened with uh, uh, visual art, I, I must uh, uh, be enormously grateful to this guy to this young guy who is professor of film theory in my university, in Palma University. Michele Guerra uh, uh, was uh, the one who convinced me uh, that we could have done some empirical research <coughs> targeting the aesthetic experience of uh, uh, film. And uh, <coughs> it was incredibly useful because uh, I, I knew very little 
uh, about uh, film aesthetics, film theory, I still know very little. Uh, so I don't want to share the blame of what is going to follow with him. Uh, his is only the credit of uh, let, making me uh, acquainted uh, with a very interesting literature uh, that I didn't know before. So, uh, as uh, is my usual uh, way to go, we spent four years uh, to study, uh, to discuss, and only finally we came up with the idea of starting uh, a series of experiments. Uh, we have done so far three experiments, only one is published, so tonight I will confine myself to the published material, but there, there is more stuff on the, on the launching pad. So with this paper, which was published in 2012, we, we try to uh, address the issue of uh, uh, filmic experience from the peculiar vantage point of embodied simulation, which is what I would like to develop. Okay, here's <coughs> Colin McGinn, The Power of Movies. The mind-body problem is the problem of explaining how conscious experience relates to the physical materials of the body and the brain. The mind-movie problem is the problem of explaining how is that the two-dimensional moving image, as we experience it in a typical feature film, managed to hook our consciousness in the way it does. So basically, it boils down to the question, how does film work? Uh, how, how is it possible to be fully absorbed, moved uh, to tears by something patently fake and artificial, uh, and it's <coughs> called bidimensional? Uh, watching a movie, makes a very interesting case for cognitive neuroscience for someone like me as it exemplifies the multi-layer relationship we entertain with the multiple worlds we inhabit. We pay a ticket, we find a seat, we wait until the room gets dark and for a couple of hours or substantially more apparently it's becoming impossible to make a movie which lasts about 90 minutes nowadays. <laughs> Uh, we, we let ourselves go, and uh, for those two hours or something, uh, we are completely uh, forgetful of uh, the real world, and we allow ourselves uh, to live the passions, the problems, the, uh, the happiness of, of the characters that we see on the, projected on the screen. So this is going to be the outline of my talk. Uh, filmic experience versus reality experience, the role of embodiment uh, played in both. Film and body, uh, again, uh, I will emphasize how old is the wine that I'm going to sell tonight. So there has been extensive uh, uh, debate on, on embodiment in relation to filmic experience, particularly in the first half of the 20th century. Then I will introduce briefly uh, very recent empirical results we obtained studying camera movements. And I will uh, finish uh, trying to address one aspect uh, of uh, uh, aesthetic insularity, namely what makes the aesthetic experience specific when uh, targeting these specific objects, uh, like the uh, feature view, and, and some temporary conclusions. Okay, one thing uh, uh, which is very important in filmic experience is the segregation of space. As I said, we are sitting on a chair and the action goes on uh, there. And uh, this short clip uh, is a beautiful piece of philosophy of uh, film experience uh, and is probably one of the most interesting. Uh, before it worked. Yeah. Okay, I, I'll, I'll use. Um, okay. It's Buster Keaton. He's a projectionist, uh, but he wants to be a detective. And finally, he decides uh, he wants to enter the scene. And uh, as soon this segregation of spaces ends. Uh, troubles begin for, for the character, as it will be evident uh, in, a, in a few seconds. <laughs> 
suppose the audience uh, is facing the stage, a theatrical stage, okay? So we could definitely walk into the stage and uh, pretend to be part of the plot. Uh, so we would create uh, definitely a mess. But our experience of the relation uh, with the characters would be completely different from, from what happens to, to Buster Keaton in this, in this piece of the film. So in a way, the segregation uh, is a necessary condition uh, to make a, a, a fully artificial uh, uh, experience really felt and really lived. And this, uh, in a way, also poses problem from my own perspective, because uh, the mechanism I'm talking about uh, basically deal with something that is relevant uh, when we are facing truly embodied uh, uh, human beings physically present uh, in our environment, uh, in our peripersonal or extrapersonal space, when here we are dealing with something that is uncommensurable with the space uh, from which uh, we have the experience. We have to be out of the screen in order to fully experience that experience. Okay. God, if somebody talks and I'm in the cinema, I drive me up the wall. <laughs> it's like a lecture to me. <laughs> so, uh, one, one way to go, one way to start, is asking ourselves the question that Stephen Shaviro asked in, in this um, very interesting book, The Cinematic Body. How can cinema have so powerful a reality effect when it's so manifestly unreal? Uh, there is no structuring lack, no primordial division, but a continuity between the physiological and affective responses of my own body and the appearances and disappearances, the mutations and the perdurances of the bodies and images on the screen. So here we have a very specific take on the issue. There is a continuity between the filmic experience and the experience uh, we make of the real world. So the underpinning physiological mechanisms do not belong to different categories, but they are coming into action, uh, triggered by different uh, uh, situational events. Perhaps they are differently modulated, but there's a lot uh, being shared by our real experience and the filmic experience. And the answer is indirectly uh, offered by Merleau-Ponty. If we now consider the film as a perceptual object, we can apply what we have just said about perception in general to the perception of a film. The film is very interesting for the embodied cognition perspective because it's really a crossroad of a variety of bodies. The body of the spectators in the first place the bodies of the film, I mean the bodies in the film, which is, in the first place, are the bodies of the characters, the actors that uh, are performed in the film, but there is another body that may induce the presence of someone who isn't really there and that can be used for diegetic purposes, the body of the camera. And finally, we have the body of the filmmaker. I was talking with uh, my colleague Michele Guerra recently. He interviewed uh, Bernardo Bertolucci recently. Uh, uh, we, <coughs> we gave him an uh, uh, honorary degree uh, at our university because, incidentally, he was born in Parma. And he was telling Michele how you have to be in the set uh, and decide which is the best way, uh, even if you have a very rigid script. He said, uh, I took the decision to move the camera uh, when shooting a scene where Marlon Brando uh, is uh, uh, raising uh, uh, up uh, uh, Maria Schneider. That was not in the screenplay, but I thought, being there at that very moment, that that was the best way to shoot the scene, and I decided it on the spot. So even the body of the filmmaker, it's really uh, uh, playing a role in the final result, what we see on the screen. <laughs> So as I said, the relationship between filmic experience and body is a known story. This is one of the earliest examples, the photodrama, uh, uh, Harry Albert Phillips, 1914. The perfect photodrama is all action, action, action. 
and by action we mean technically visualized interpretation of whatsoever nature that convincingly contributes to the perfect illusion of emotionally seeing a dramatic story. Even more important than that is this book, The Photoplay, published by Hugo Münsterberg. Münsterberg was invited uh, in Harvard by William James. He died pretty young, but he had time to write this book, uh, uh, which he published in 1916, looking for the means by which the moving picture impresses us and appeal us, uh, appeal to us. So, in this book, he addresses this sort of question, what are the psychological factors shaping our film experience? And he concludes that film experience might be described as a cured simulation <coughs> of key mental and body function. And glossing on this book, uh, Murray Smith, in the um, Entry Consciousness in the Rutherford's Companion to Philosophy and Film, published in 2009, wrote, uh, the conscious mind is integral to the earliest extended work of film theory in English, Hugo Münsterberg, the photoplay. Münsterberg focused on the way in which the development of technique and form over the first two decades of cinema, the era of silent movies, sought, on his view, to mimic the mental mechanism of attention, memory, and emotion. And if you read this book now, I mean, it's easy to spot parts that, uh, I mean, do not hold, uh, 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 the passing of time, but still it is an enormously uh, stimulating reading in the light of what we uh, 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 learned about uh, the relationship between the brain, the body, and our senses. Here's another example, La Naissance du Cinéma by Léon Moussignac, published in 1925, where he emphasizes the interest of cinema for learning more about the physiological uh, responses uh, taking place in spectators when uh, uh, beholding a, a feature film. And these two people, Dr. Toulouse and Dr. Morg, uh, engage themselves in physiological research, uh, measuring uh, the breathing frequency when people were watching comic movies, dramatic movies, uh, and he wrote uh, <coughs> the Réaction Respiratoire au cours de projection cinématographique, pardon my French, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the title of one of the empirical papers they published in 1920, and uh, uh, Moussignac writes, Le docteur Toulouse and Morg établissant que, étant scientifiquement démontré que la perception du mouvement fait naître l'ébauche du mouvement correspondant. Il se produirait à l'écran un phénomène du même genre que la suggestion hypnotique pratiquée après avoir mis le sujet dans une attitude donnée. So they relate to hypnosis, which was still quite popular uh, back then. Uh, now, we would employ a completely different uh, uh, word. We wouldn't uh, rely on hypnosis. We would rather rely on empathic mechanism but the, uh, envisaging the possibility to investigate the physiological correlates of the power of moving images was present from the very beginning of uh, a conscious thought on what film is and why film uh, is so able to capture the attention. So there is a, a totally French-speaking part of this story. Uh, here I just uh, uh, decided to focus on three authors, Poincea, <coughs> Michot and uh, Henri Ballon. Uh, so there is a very early interest of filmology in spectators' <coughs> motility. Coencea uh, referred to the phenomenon of mental vertigo and physiological storms. These are the words he employs induced by film vision. Michot introduces the notion of mouvement incipient. Je sais ce que l'autre fait. I feel what is the other is doing. Which, by the way, I know what you're doing. I think it's the English title of Giacomo Rizzolatti uh, and Corrado Sinigalia uh, book on mirror neurons. Vallon, identification with film characters on the basis of spectators' bodily posture. Je suis dans le film qui est projeté devant le moi. So I think, in principle, all of these notions are compatible or in different ways dealt with by uh, embodied simulation, the model I to you in the previous two lectures.
So which strategies do movies employ to involve viewers, making them empathize with the characters on the screen, and eventually shaping up a virtual and still very clearly fed form of intersubjectivity? Here is the hypothesis. Cinematic meaning does not depend just on concepts and propositions, but also heavily relies on sensory motor schemas which get the viewer literally in touch with the screen, shaping a multimodal form of simulation which exploits all the potentialities of our brain-body system. So, a possible way to start uh, to empirically address, uh, validate, to falsify this hypothesis is to start from film style. Why film style? Because film style creates the condition for an embodied film cognition, and in so doing, it establishes a continuity between our embodied reality and our embodied vision. But at this point, Colin could raise his hand, as he did in, in last, and say, what about the aesthetic specificity? And he would be, again, really right. So I, I'll ask you to be patient, uh, as I will come back to this point, hopefully, in the very last part of the talk. So, as I said, one way to go is to address uh, film from, from a stylistic point of view. This is the earliest image of an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> as usual, it is very, always very useful to, to test to investigate where, where our words come from. And the word style come from this tool, the stylus that was used to write on, on a wax-covered uh, wooden tablet. So when we refer to style in, in, in relation to film, there are at least three very important elements that all together make film style as we conceive of it. The specificity of the medium, the specificity of the socio-cultural and economic context, and the specificity of the authors, although this last aspect uh, recently is uh, heavily debated, and Michele was telling me he was participating to, a, or he will participate to a meeting, well, the necessity uh, uh, to keep the notion of autoreality is relevant or not for film studies. There are people claiming that should give up with the idea of autoreality and focus on the specific forms of filmic expression, no matter who's the author using them. We, we, we would gain more knowledge uh, on film uh, following this trade. It's still a minority of film scholars who hold this uh, view. This is part of the current debate. So, uh, Tim Smith has been doing very important empirical work on uh, investigating by tracking eye movements, one uh, uh, of the uh, aspect of film style, which is continuity editing. The idea uh, uh, which is at the basis of the classic uh, Hollywood-like feature film, which basically uh, wants to make the cat as invisible as possible, and indeed if you test it in people, most of the time people are not able of telling you what, when the scene was cut. So continuity editing is synonymous with the Hollywood style of filmmaking and emerges during the earliest day of cinema and has been conventionalized uh, uh, in the uh, blooming of the classic Hollywood movie era between the 30s and the 40s uh, of last century. And as uh, Tim Smith goes on, the basic principle of this kind of editing lies in the compliance to set of rules or abstract heuristics or rule of thumb describing how a scene should be staged, filmed and edited so that the viewer can comprehend the event flow with minimal effort. And regarding montage, which is one of the uh, key aspects of filmic style, this minimal effort has been declared to correspond with the avoidance of any major discontinuities regarding space, time and causation between the two edited shots, thus the name continuity editing. Uh, in the last 20 years, phenomenology uh, <clears throat> has started to play uh, a quite important uh, uh, influence in the debate uh, among film scholars, 
And one of the most prominent scholars who are constantly making use of, of phenomenology in addressing film theory is uh, Vivian Sobchak. Uh, first with this book, The Address of the Eye, and then with her second book, Carnal Thoughts. Cinematic language, uh, writes uh, Sobchak, is grounded in the more original pragmatic language of embodied existence. We can share with the movie behaviors and acts since it is able to make this exchange possible thanks to its intersubjective nature. And intersubjectivity here is dealt with mainly as uh, intercorporeality, of course. New film theories have largely accepted the idea that style should be conceived of by starting from the bodily engagement implied <coughs> by it. And here is another uh, quotation from Murray Smith, this time from his book Engaging Characters, where he speaks of the sixth sense. Motor mimicry, like an low level physiological mechanism, which constantly probes the meaning of our environment and accompanies our viewing of classical film, like the sixth sense. Let me see if it starts. Yes. Back then there was no handicap, so it's a very complex movement mm -hmm. with the dolly and the... Uh... I'm surprised Mr. Devlin coming tonight. Uh, I don't blame anyone. Okay, sorry for this abrupt uh, <laughs> stop. <laughs> so this is a tracking shot, okay? There's no cut. We are induced to think that uh, Ingrid Berman uh, uh, is ready to grab the keys because she understood there's something going on in the wine cellar and she must get hold of the keys, exploiting the fact that the Nazi partner uh, is in the bathroom. So there's a lot of suspense because as spectators we <coughs> wonder whether she, she will manage <coughs> to get hold of the keys without being caught. Uh, so when the tracking shot begins, we tend to believe that that tracking shot portrays the walking of Ingrid Berman towards the keys. And when finally we have a zoom on, on the keys, we think she's ready to grab them. Then there is a sudden cut and realize that she's still standing where she was at the beginning of the scene. So it's a typical fake point of view, okay? So we, we commented this sequence in our paper uh, uh, with the Michaelis. Hitchcock's peculiar use of the tracking shot mimics both Alicia's, the character played by Bergman, potential <coughs> approach to the keys, and the viewer's own potential approach. So here is our interpretation, our reductionist uh, translation of what's going on <coughs> on the screen in terms of the neural mechanism I, I, I briefly summarized for you in the first of my lecture. The simulation of grasping the keys is, on the one hand, the result of the simulation of a motor act, which makes the viewer resonate with a camera movement, and on the other hand, the simulation of a grasping act evoked by the affordance implied by the keys that are made ready to hand by the same camera movement. <coughs> so the idea is that by means of a body simulation, the viewer resonates with the camera's behavior, and by reenacting the motor act of the camera, he or she approaches the keys, which finally enter the simulated peripersonal space. And at that very same moment, the keys become a potentially graspable object, and the likely activation of the viewer's canonical neurons trigger grasping simulation. That's what makes this scene so compellingly vivid. And once we realize that she still has to go through this walking and grasping, the suspense is doubled. Uh, because we, we are going to experience it twice, in, in a way. Here's a quote from Douglas MacDougall, The Corporeal Image. Images we make are, in a sense, mirrors of our bodies, replicating the whole of the body's activity with its physical movements, its shifting attention, and its conflicting impulses toward order and disorder. 
And here comes a very interesting point. Corporeal images are not just the images of our bodies. They are also images of the body behind the camera and its relation with the world. And directors learn very quickly how to use this camera movement playing with the fake point of view to induce very uh, uh, compelling emotional effects like this famous uh, uh, um, scene from the spiral staircase, Dimitri. Okay, the camera moves, it's the murderer looking at her. Wait a minute, he's not, he's dead, you see? So, there are many different bodies we, we may resonate with. We are induced to think that we are looking at the female character in this scene, looking through the eyes of the murderer to discover immediately afterwards that that was not. This is a, a sort of God's point of view, still very carefully resembling the walking movement of a human being, which is used for uh, filmic expressive purposes, on, on purpose, uh, by the uh, director. <clears throat> so, movement, space, action and objects, characters, position and behaviors make the film a place of virtual interaction and a sophisticated form of mediated intersubjectivity. And all of these elements are connected to the function of a body simulation. The ways through which the viewer is involved in the story are not just offline mental processes, but primarily online bodily forms of intersubjectivity. <coughs> the body simulation based approach can foster specific experiments on different stylistic solutions. And I believe it could also have explaining stylistic changes caused by the constant evolution of viewers' ability in playing a role in a virtual world. And According to some famous movie director, namely uh, uh, Spielberg, the future of film, of feature film, is, is uh, total interactivity. So we will have to forget sitting uh, quiet in a, in, a, in a chair watching what the, the director has cooked for us, but we will take an active <coughs> role in the story and even possibly influencing by our, uh, our choices how the story ends. That's, that's one vision of the future of cinema. <clears throat> the intercorporeality implied by a model simulation represents a valid starting point, in my opinion, <coughs> to analyze the mode of presence of cinema and to shed new light on viewers' responses. So can we use this approach as a sort of stylistic index? Can this approach help us understand the meaning of a particular way of framing the scene or of a particular style of camera movement? Can a body simulation help enriching the debate on mediated experiences? And camera movements uh, are a possible starting point, and indeed, we decided to start precisely uh, uh, addressing uh, the role of camera movements. How camera movements differently affect the brain of uh, spectators, of beholders. Basically, here we are dealing with uh, three types of moving the image. Uh, by means of technical devices. Zooming, dolly, and uh, uh, steady cam. That's what was the focus of our experiment. And one particular uh, uh, movie director, artist, Stanley Kubrick, in different movies relies predominantly or more often on several of these uh, uh, technical ways of uh, filming scenes, uh, and one particular example where zooming, particularly zooming out, uh, is used heavily is in uh, Barry Lynn. He's an expert from Alexander Walker, uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick director. Dramatic close-ups are rare or non-existent. We are being taken on a guided tour with the guide's polite but firm instructions. <laughs> Don't go too near to the picture. And indeed, I, I've been watching Barry Lyndon recently, and you have the idea sometimes, like in this 
wonderful uh, 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 frame, um, uh, frozen image, uh, uh, to behold paintings that refer to this particular age. But many movie directors don't like the zooming uh, tool. Here is that chronometer. One tool I never use is the zoom lens because it doesn't correspond to my idea of filmmaking. The zoom is just an optical gadget, it's purely practical. And I will always prefer moving the camera, uh, either by hand or by steady cam, because I find that it physically projects you inside the film space. And zooming doesn't achieve that, it keeps you outside. Bernardo Bertolucci, in an interview, I hardly ever use a zoom, I don't know why, but I find that there's something fake about its movement. The Dolly, Kubrick again, if you remember the first part of the movie, when the train uh, occurs in Paris Island, here's uh, 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 Kubrick talking about the movie, the filming of the movie. In Paris Island prologue, geometric traveling back and forth, and the rigor of the training ritual suggests an unforgiving, stifling, and claustrophobic logic. And this impression you get of bo bodies moving mechanically, you have this uh, sense of artificiality in spite of the fact that uh, you are watching a bunch of young people uh, uh, constantly interacting and talking to each other, is technically realized by a heavy reliance on the mechanical movement of the dolly. So in a way, there is a, a, a nice fit between the overall impression that the director wants to convey and technical usage of the, of, the, of the medium explicitly used just to convey that impression. And finally we get to the, to the Stenicam. Here we are in the labyrinth of uh, The Shining. Uh, here's a Again, Kubrick uh, uh, talking. The steady can smooths out any unsteadiness because it's anchored to the body of the cameraman, allowing the cameraman to move or even to run, stabilizing at the same time uh, the position of the camera. So you don't have all of the uh, annoying uh, uh, shifting of the angle uh, that you would end up with uh, uh, holding the camera in your hands. The fast-flowing camera movement in the maze uh, would have been impossible to do without the Steadicam. You couldn't lay down dolly tracks without the camera seeing them, and in any case, a dolly couldn't go around the right-angle corners of the maze pathways, and similar couldn't go around the sharp corners of the corridor of the hotel. The sound adds a lot to the scene, but again, normally, here you would have a cut when he disappears. But you don't. And that adds to the, to the atmosphere, uh, because you have the impression that you are looking through the eyes of a sort of ghost. Otherwise, the scene would have been cut when, when it disappeared, but it's like someone pursuing the child. Here's Larry McConkey, who is one of the two inventors of the Steadicam. By means of the Steadicam, the camera becomes like another person, and the audience becomes connected through that person to the other actors. The audience becomes more empathetic, more involved, and this is one, one of my most favorite long shots. We're the only winners. Like one of my chance. favorite directors. That cash flows from the tables to our boxes, through the cage, and into the most sacred room in the casino. The place where they add up all the money, the holy of holies, the count room. Now this place was off limits. Even I couldn't get inside. But it was my job to keep it filled with cash, that's for sure. They had so much fucking money in there, you could build a house out of stacks of $100 bills. And the best part was that upstairs, the board of directors didn't know what the fuck was going on. I mean, to them, everything looked on the up and up, right? <laughs> 
wrong. The guys inside the counting room were all slipped in there to skim the joint dry. They do short counts, they lose fill slips, they'd even take cash right out of the drop boxes. And it was up to this guy right here, standing in front of about two million dollars, to skim the cash off the top without anybody getting wise, the IRS or anybody. Now notice how in the count room nobody ever seems to see anything. Somehow somebody's always looking the other way. Now look at these guys, they look busy, right? They're counting money, who wants to bother them? I mean, God forbid they should make a mistake and forget to steal. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're in and you're out. Pass the jag off guard who gets an extra seat over me just to watch the door. I mean, it's routine. Business as usual. In, out, along, goodbye, and that's all there is to it. Just another fat fuck walking out of the casino with a suitcase. <laughs> okay. I, I put one after the other, these two long shots, both shot with a, with a steady cam, to show how different from a stylistic point of view and also from a diegetic point of view you, you can use the very same technical solution. So we are not there. <laughs> we are, we are, we are, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we are not able to deal with these subtle stylistic uh, differences. In the first place, uh, we had the impression to follow along uh, the path of some sort of ghost chasing the child in the corridor of the hotel mm -hmm. in The Shining. Here, and I think it is done on purpose, uh, we are following the guy who's entering with the briefcase in the room uh, and the first part of the scene, the, the, the narrating voice is that of Bob De Niro. After a while, we see the guy in the face, so we are not moving along with him anymore and then the voice of Joe Pesci kicks in. So here, uh, I think the, the purpose of using the Steadicam is not to let the spectators embody with a character who's carrying the, but just to put you right in the middle of the action. And it is also for that purpose that there are two narrators that are employed uh, to, to tell the people what's going on in the counting room. So we try to address uh, how different for your brain is watching the same scene when shot from a static camera with a camera uh, using the zooming lens with a camera moving on a dolly or with a, uh, a static cam. We didn't shoot the scene ourselves, we went to a professional film studio uh, in order to have the technical part worked out properly. And when we published the paper, we barely mentioned aesthetics. We saw the paper as an attempt to study mirror, mirroring mechanism, motor resonance, in a kind of more ecological way by simulating a viewer who, as normally happens in real life, is approaching the, the acting agent. And we wrote two lines at the end of the discussion, <clears throat> making the claim that this result might be eventually relevant also for uh, aesthetic issues, period. Because uh, we thought that if we were about to make a more explicit aesthetic case, the, the paper probably would have never been published or with a long delay <laughs> on the basis of our previous experience with the Lucio Fontana's cut. So, is the mirror mechanism response differently uh, to the observation of the same action film by a static camera in comparison with a moving camera approaching the scene? And second, is this activation modulated by different ways a camera can be used to approach the scene? We use high density uh, EEG, measuring um, uh, event related desynchronization, the usual mu rhythm recorded from the central electrodes monitoring what's going on, on in the motor cortex and occipital electrodes monitoring the visual cortex. Uh, so we had zooming, dolly, and steady cam. So fixation cross, a video clip filmed in one of these four different ways then catch trials in 20% of the cases we were asking what was the object grasped by the character to keep the attention of participants alive. And then five seconds of uh, inter-trial interval to allow resynchronization to occur. 
which uh, we also wanted to measure. And uh, we had a, a female and a male uh, actors. Here's the static shot. Here's the zoom shot. One example of a dolly shot. And one example of the steady cam shot. Result, the steady can produce stronger desynchronization than all other conditions over all epochs of video clip observation until the beginning of resynchronization, which is what you visualize here. The steady cam is the pink one, which is the lowest, this is a logarithmic scale. When we measure desynchronization, the lower the level, the stronger the effect. So participants, then we ask a lot of questions to participants, and they perceive the movements of the steady cam as being the most natural and most resembling the movements of an approaching observer, thus eliciting the feeling that the observer himself or herself would walk towards the scene. So how realistic did you find the camera movement? Steady cam wins. How much do you feel the camera movement resembled the person movement when approaching the scene? And not surprisingly, the steady cam wins again. Conclusions. And now I'm about to address very briefly the. Uh, so, just to summarize what uh, we got, we were able to show that motor resonance can be driven differently with different intensity according to the way in which the very same scene is being filmed. The next step, which are uh, the experiment already took place, we are finalizing data analysis, we are, the next question was, what will happen if we move the very same steady can or dolly in an empty room with no scene to be observed? Our prediction would be that you still resonate with the body with a body that you, in principle, don't see, but it's the body of embodied by, by the camera movement. So our hypothesis is that even the movement of the camera in an empty scene would induce uh, a motor resonance. Hopefully, if we are really lucky, we, we could be, in principle, in a position to show that this activation of the motor system doesn't deal uh, with the same motor center, the resonant, where you see a grasping hand, but rather with a walking body. <clears throat> we'll see. That much depends on the um, capability of the source localization system, since we are not doing uh, fMRI uh, to possibly differentiate these two different spots of activation within the motor stream. Okay, aesthetic insularity. What makes this experience so special? with respect to when we see something in real life. So the difference between the direct perception of reality and then mediated by cinematic fiction, when investigated by cognitive neuroscience, this is my impression, is likely not as sharp as one might expect. And I think that experimental aesthetics can help us in better understanding the complexity of our film experience <laughs> making it clear that meaning-making processes are not confined to the domain of the cognitive, even if this distinction is debatable, but that would lead me uh, too far, uh, but also grow out of the bodily and pre-cognitive contact between us and the film. So, in a, in, in a sentence, why is artistic fiction sometimes more powerful than real life in evoking our emotional engagement and empathic involvement? That applies also to novels, no? just a few words. Uh, my hypothesis is by liberating embodied simulation with respect to how embodied simulation <coughs> works in real life. So, in other words, film experience or narrative experience, more generally, besides being a suspension of this belief, which is the usual way to go, can be also interpreted as a sort of liberated embodied simulation. What do I mean by that? I mean that when we adopt an aesthetic stance, like spending some money uh, to watch a film, 
we are forced to loosen our grip on the world, liberating new energies that up to that moment were not fully available because when dealing with reality, we are always, in a way or the other, on guard. We are ready to react, in a way or the other, to what reality offers to us. Uh, fight or flight or all the sorts of daily activities that uh, occupy us uh, in our prosaic uh, uh, real life. Uh, putting them to the service of a new regional ontology that can reveal new aspects of our reality and about ourselves. Well, that was one of the specific points made by Colin Blackmore last Wednesday. When I see art, I'm entering in, in, in a totally new dimension. I learn something I didn't know. I see the very same object I see every day, but I see it in, in a completely different way. If made by a real artist, oh, this is the way we go normally. So in film, we are free to love, hate, be afraid, but always from a safety distance. And this safety distance and our being still, like in dreams, I don't think this is a coincidence, enable us to maximize our connectedness to the fictional cinematic world. Being still, if you think about it, is a constant of our experience of artworks. We are still standing in front of a painting, we are still sitting in a concert hall or in a opera house. We are still, when watching a film, we are still, when reading a novel, unless we are jogging, listening to an audiobook. That makes a, a, a very specific and very recent case, which is not covered in my app, I'm afraid. Here is a quote from one of the earliest books of Edgar Morin, The Cinema or the Imaginary Man. Very, very poetic. For the spectator, deep in his cell, a moment closed off to everything except the screen, enveloped in the double placenta of an anonymous community and obscurity, when, the, the emphasis is mine, when the channels for action are blocked, then the locks to myth, dream, and magic are opened up. If you think about it, one of, of the most vivid conscious experience we make is while dreaming. And in dreaming, perhaps non-coincidentally, our muscle tone reach a minimum, which is also a very dangerous situation. That's why people believe that dreaming is so important, because in spite of the fact that we are easily prey of the attack of any predator, because our muscle tone is, is so low, we kept this trait uh, up to uh, up to us. We don't experience uh, muscle atonia uh, happily enough when we are watching a movie, but nevertheless we are still. And I believe that this being still is one key ingredient which maximizes this mechanism that I've been dealing with so far, making them more effective. Because if you say, okay, it's a suspension of this belief, everything is fine, but a suspension of this belief doesn't explain the extra that comes from free when I uh, behold uh, a painting, when I read a novel, when I watch uh, a movie. That's something that is not automatically bought you by the suspension of this belief. So there is something different which brings in uh, uh, these uh, uh, amplified uh, emotional engagement experience that makes you thought so when you get out of the movie theater you keep on thinking to what you saw you have debate over dinner with friends or, uh, eating your pizza and you keep on speculating what just you saw so liberated and body simulation might contribute to simultaneously address both the issue of fictionality and of aesthetic insularity a similar, film, uh, uh, a similar uh, approach can be applied to the creative process of the filmmaker, in this case of the artist. The artwork becomes the mediator of the sensory motor and emotional resonance that establishes between the artist and the observer, thus allowing beholders to feel the artwork in an embodied manner. So, in principle, this take provides a potentially unified level of description of both artists and beholders' relation with the artwork.
So the idea is uh, first that we must look at aesthetic from an anthropological dimension fully within an evolutionary framework, which doesn't necessarily square with rely on the peacock tail and the uh, usual uh, discourse that is related with this point. Experimental aesthetics implies trying to understand the physiology of symbol making and of its reception, <coughs> shedding light of one particular limited aspect uh, of embodied uh, uh, experience we make of artworks, which can be uniquely addressed by cognitive neuroscience and experimental science. And before, that was, this is the last slide, I want really to thank all the people that made these lectures possible. Many of my former PhD students, uh, Christina, starting from the up and left, Christina Berchio, previous PhD student of mine, of course, David Friedberg, uh, Michele Guerra, who is a, a film scholar in Parma, uh, Catherine Hyman, who will, whose PhD thesis is all based on the previous experiment and the next two uh, I, I didn't uh, tell you about. Uh, Beatrice Sbriscia Fioretti, Maria Teresa Sestito, and finally, last but not least, uh, Ma Maria Alessandra Umiltà, who is leading the EG lab and also happens to be my wife. Thank you so much. <laughs>